Okay. Okay, I think we're ready to start. So uh, Tristan's been a really long time uh, known contributor. You can tell how long he's been involved by the length of the emails that he sends to mailing lists. Um, you <laughs> so stealing you, my punchline, are you? As, as you can see, my slides are not pretty, and he stole my punchline. But uh, <laughs> if you if you know from reading any of my emails, this talk is going to be very long. <laughs> you probably won't make it through. <laughs> so, so BuildStream is a new build tool, and everybody wants to know why are we doing that, right? So, why BuildStream? Um, I'm going to try not to talk too technical because then you'll all fall asleep. So nothing is more gratifying than integration work, right? I just love integration work so much that I thought if there was another build tool, more people can do integration work and we can all be a big, happy integration family. So you wake up in the morning, you build some software. The build fails. You look on Google or you check the LFS manual. Linux from scratch has a lot of solutions. You make a two-line patch and you submit it to open embedded core, Bugzilla, or such, right? And then they tell you, no, you have to send an email. And probably you forgot to write signed off by, so you have another. So basically, actually, you're, you're spending a lot of time doing nothing. And uh, in the end, integration work is not as fun as you hoped it would be. So yeah, basically, I just think it's a bit sad that um, we see these communities like Yocto and Buildroot back in the day. and. Uh, Integration work is so boring and seemingly mon mundane, and 90% of the time you're doing really boring stuff. Yet, we need some of the most skilled engineers with at least 10 years of experience to do this work. And you have hundreds of them sitting in the channel, and they're just burning out these two-line patches. And well, no, they're doing more interesting stuff like converting hundreds of spec files to build on Yocto or such. Really fun stuff, right? So there's a lot of duplication of work. We have uh, a number of different distros, and they all want to run on the latest new hardware, the latest new architecture, and they run into the same problems. And you find all the answers on Google for all of these different GCC 6 or 7, introduce a new warning and everything is broken. Lots of tedious stuff. And yeah, once in a blue moon, you're integrating and you have something really difficult to solve. Like, I don't know if anybody here besides Matthias got the, the, the chance to try to make GNOME initial setup work and <laughs> actually write a PAM configuration and, and put GNOME keyring in place and make all of these services talk to each other. It's a real pain, but it's, it's the best part of your day as an integration engineer. It can take you two days, and it's a lot of fun, actually. Right? <laughs> so yeah, to be honest, so how can we how can we improve the lives of these integration engineers? How can we reduce this amount of effort? And how can we get some of them back working on real software so we can actually make better stuff, right? So that's what we're, we're looking at with BuildStream. We're looking at a, a bunch of different pain points. And um, we want to see if we can get a tool that's suitable to adapt itself to many different use cases. So some of the things that we looked at before while, while writing the design of BuildStream was what are the integration pain points and the developer pain points. So this maybe falls in both categories. But when we rely on host tools, we have 
non-deterministic build results. So we don't know what the user had in their host. So you have like, if you have Yocto, for example, then you're building your first stage sysroot on top of your host tools. So once you get past there, theoretically everything is pretty much deterministic because you've built this version of GCC, but there's always cracks, right? So you always have this host contamination issue and that's because you're bootstrapping off of your host tools and we want to avoid that. So we killed host tools thanks to Jörg Billiter here who said, I hate host tools. He hates host tools. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, in, in Yocto you have this kind of uh, supported distros, back to the same point basically. You have supported distros and when a new distro is released, it needs to be vetted and there's a whole category of bugs which uh, need to be fixed by Yocto developers in order to support a new distro. And for us, for example, with uh, JH build, it's uh, impossible to say that what I've built on my machine is going to resemble what you built on your machine, even if you built master on the same day because host tools. Um, cross compiling all the way up the stack is something that I want to hopefully abolish. And we're talking about, uh, so basically we, we have cross comp compilation support. We always will have cross compilation support for the tool chain for glibc, gcc, your compiler, your kernel. We're always gonna need that for cross bootstrapping. But why do we have to maintain two separate sysroots to build all the way up to a desktop that's gonna run on ARM, right? I mean, if we took all of that time that people are submitting these patches to upstream saying your GTK or your application doesn't build properly on this obscure architecture, what if we took all of that energy and just made virtualization work a little bit better and we can just build in virtualized self-hosting environments, right? I just like the idea and I, I just don't like to see all of that wasted time. Um, so we did some experimentation with that last year. It's not in build stream now, but I'm looking forward to making cross, cross sandboxes where you can virtually self-host compile and cut out the whole cross compilation factor. Um, yeah, basically same thing. So another point which was difficult for three different projects that I worked on, uh, including Base Rock, Build Root, I didn't work on it, but used Build Root and Yocto. They all have this, every recipe to build everything under the sun in one repository which creates a lot of friction for your development team because basically you usually have a lot of people who are working on the low levels and then you have this few different groups who are, one of them is uh, I want to do this platform for uh, IVI and uh, automotive grade, blah, blah, blah. And, <laughs> and the others is a desktop or whatever, right? And you have various groups, they're working in the same repository and they want to roll the same stable release, but you always have somebody who says it's a great idea to upgrade system D today, but they're not gonna test every different build result. So we usually in this kind of custom, custom Linux distro do it yourself kind of build tool, we don't have a separation which allows higher level projects to decide what stable base they're, they're going to take. It's just all in one repository. We have plans for that, for making um, interdependent projects with BuildStream, but that's n one of the only things that's not implemented today. So I'm uh, a bit behind on my points here. I have a, yeah. 
so I can see the future. Right, modular projects. Um, are you going to keep flashing me the like how much time we have left? Because uh, I don't. When I get to okay, can you give me sooner? No. <laughs> um, so. Hmm. Right. So tight coupling of build tooling and build content. This is um, something I ran to ran into when I was asked to do a really strange thing which was to take all of the software which worked in one build system, which was RPM and OBS, and put it into another system. Or actually, Patrick Oily did a similar project with Yocto and Tizen, just this spec to Yocto thing, right? So how can you take this whole stack and build it the same way in another system and you just basically can't. You can't just take this version of build root and then change everything in the guts, or this version of Yocto and change everything, because you have these recipes and these. You have the part which says, how am I going to build this? How am I going to use this tool? And the part which says, how am I going to build this tool so I can use it later? It's all mishmashed in the same kind of mess. So. You have this in Yocto, you have the auto tools, macros, and BB classes, which know that they've installed this file at exactly this location because they depend on the recipe. And then you just can't change everything, which is a bit of a pain. Um, right. So it's usually very difficult to, you can, you can, take this base, but basically the, the build system goes with the distro, usually, traditionally. And it mostly holds true with self-hosting package-based operating systems as well. You know. um, the combinatorial explosion, right? So when you have one of these horrible, huge projects with so many recipes flying around, then you usually want to build things for different targets, different use cases, different applications. And you end up adding a bunch of variables around. And one of the ways is the Gen 2 use flags. Another way is build root has this uh, like make menu config from the kernel where everything depends on everything. And well, it's, it's a bit better than use flags, I think. So basically, use flags is like uh, to say that, oh, I have a module GTK, and I can have use uh, Broadway, right? So I can just add a, turn on a variable and say that this one will, this GTK will build with Broadway. But the big problem with that is that when you have a project that has so many kind of configurations that are possible, you don't know, you can't even really say, what are all the different outputs that my project can make, right? So you can't validate your system because you don't even really know what your system is. You, you maybe have one configuration that's regularly tested. So we wanted to reduce the amount of configurability and make it more declarative. So we have an idea where one element has variance and the other element can depend on an element with variance. And I'm getting into the boring details section, so I, I, I'm going to skip out on that. But we have a BOF where we'll talk about all the details if people want to. Um, so, right, so how can I validate this project? So basically, the idea with that is that we just have a few top-level targets. And these targets, they decide what variants of their elements they depend on. And that way, we reduce the combinatorial explosion. So what about the application poor sods? Um, 
So nowadays, actually since a long time, developers need to consider their target runtime. So for a lot of free software developers, we just don't care. We just have a make file, we have auto tools and such, and uh, those distro people just come along and they grab our packages from git.gnome.org and they do what they want and then eventually it ends up on a machine. But some of us who cared about doing OS X bundles, for example, or the Windows bundles, or who have dabbled in uh, App Image Kit because we were all waiting for Alex's heroic flat pack to finally arrive, or Glick to finally materialize. Um, so we, a lot of us have had the experience to maintain these subdirectories which have a lot of huge different build scripts which actually take care of the environment where I'm going to install. So nowadays you, you can be installed on the system, you can be installed on the flat pack, you can be, maybe you want an OS X bundle, right? Now we're not really there to say that you can have one build stream project that builds your app and also spits out an OS X bundle. <laughs> but it would be cool, come on. I mean, I've been, I've been trying to, I'm, I've always fell behind. As soon as I lost my Mac, MacBook, I never made another OS X Glade release. And people are still poking us for the Win32 releases. Somebody made one and we didn't even update the web page because we're bastards. But we have this huge subdirectory with all kinds of build scripts. You can try them. And we won't update the web page. <laughs> so developers want quick edit, compile, and test cycles. And that's something that doesn't usually come out of the box with uh, the kind of build tooling that you use to build a whole customized operating system. JH Build does it very well. That's the main thing that JH Build does very well is it, it keeps your, you have this home where you, you've installed everything and you can always just drop into a shell and build there and when something goes wrong it interactively says, hey, pick me, pick me. I broke. So, also JH Build has build one, which uh, means you don't have to build all your reverse dependencies. All right, and it has one directory with all the source code, so you can just edit it and you have your change. Right, another problem that we do have in GNOME specifically is how do we hack on GDM? Actually, I don't even know. Um, I, I spun up VMs of my own hand, handmade and, and tried to get this GNOME initial setup to work with uh, manually rebuilding and it was a real pain. But uh, so that's something that we did do in BuildStream. We don't have with the project that we're automatically converting. I'll get to that later. But yes, we, we can build VMs and it's entirely in user space. As a regular user, you can just whip up a VM with what you've built a, as long as it's for x86. Uh, we need to write another one for the ARM and, and such. So. That should that should help. It should help with. Uh, you can just edit a module and then whip together your your VM again, and then you'll have your changes and you can test again, right? Uh, this one. So, I'm a poor little library maintainer and I don't have any dependencies. But what I do breaks everything, and I'd love to try everything, but I don't want to build it. Right, or I would be an evolution mail developer, but damn it, depends on WebKit, so I'll never do it. Um, 
So what we've done for that is we have uh, artifact share. So there's a kind of a strict and a non-strict build mode, which I won't get into the details of. But basically, I can put together whatever everybody's latest build for GNOME, if they were allowed to upload, or if we had an auto builder uploading to an artifact share, then I can say that I want to just make a workspace and edit this glib thing, and uh, it will just download the build results of every different module that I wanted, and it will assemble them, and then I can boot something or test something in a sandbox. And then I don't have to build WebKit because somebody else built WebKit and why waste, right? So in summary, there's a lot of disconnected build tooling out there for different purposes. We have JH build for the developer and certainly other things for developers. We have, I'm sure, other things than Yocto and BuildRoot for custom embedded Linux and bootstrapping new architectures and this kind of stuff. Uh, RPM dpackage, usually running on OBS these days for the self-hosting distributions and people doing custom Linux using these tools as well. Flatpak Builder for Flatpaks. So all of these have different feature sets, and uh, we had our own build tooling as well, which also suffered from the, the before build stream, we had other tooling, and we had a lot of bright ideas, but we built this whole thing around what we were building, so there was no reason for anybody else to get involved unless they were doing exactly what our build tooling was built to be for. So we wanted to do something that we could reuse. But there's some intersection of, uh, of interest, and we can reuse it for a, a bunch of different things. Um, not all of these things have the features we want in one tool. so. We made another one. So, yay! Demo, demo. Um, okay, so this is the boring part. Huh? I'll just do this to show. So this, this is a project here, which if you have followed my blog at all, you're going to know that since maybe six weeks or two months ago, we've been converting every 10 minutes the GNOME module sets into a build stream project so that you can at any time build GNOME using build stream and it will be a direct conversion of the latest and greatest JH build module sets. Um, what's different from that repository and this one is this is a little fork which I did not get to merge into my conversion tool yet which takes the GNOME module sets and also has a variant. So you can see this one says, does it? Yeah, it says GNOME system, right? And that's basically the default variant if I want to just build all of core, right? And I have another variant which is the flat pack variant and it will generate a flat pack, a GNOME SDK and platform runtime from the same project. So it's basically the converted project with a few changes I added and I, I still have to factor that into my conversion script, right? And so this, you won't believe me, and that's fine, is gedit built from my GNOME conversion using BuildStream, right? But as you can see, it's got a really big header bar, and it makes my time really, really small. I think it has to do with the screen here. Anyway, so since I know you won't believe me, let's try something funky. Um, 
we had promised a lot of cool features to uh, get parity with JH Build because JH Build is really practical for developers and we were not, but we made it. And just if I can, uh, it's gonna be here. I have a yes, check out. So, oh no, 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 sorry. It's a better if I just do it here. So I'm going to check out GTK. And now I have a GTK checkout, which I can modify, and the results will go into my build. So this is kind of with a deterministic, self-contained kind of mm, build system that wants to be in control of everything. We don't just have checkouts lying around. We have mirrors and such. And this one means that what I build from this directory is going to go into my build and cache keys will be calculated differently and so on. If I go and find it, um, ah, right. been a while. Okay, so let's do something funny. All right. I did a build with this before, but I wonder if it's going to use a cache result. I want to, uh, whatever, let's just, doesn't matter. 45? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. Nah. It could be. It could be. Um, show, uh, is that possible? Ah, right, 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 right. So did that patch that we did last night not work? <laughs> okay, well, l we, we'll, we'll try to build it anyway, um, because the compose and the deploy, they're showing up cached, but it's supposed to rebuild them. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, so, huh? Uh, It's not correct. It's not correct. Um, okay. So that didn't work. Sorry about that. I'm going to have to hack around this. Right? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. He screwed up his demo.
Okay. I had tested this. So what happened there, right, is that we have this dual cash key calculation, which I was not supposed to talk about, but basically with, with JH build and for a developer, you want to be able to test something without building everything, but how do you know what reverse dependencies you still have to rebuild? Well, we added a flag for that, but it didn't work, right? So if you can see on the left, some of these cache keys are dim. That means they are not what they should be. So if we were to rebuild them with the GTK, against the GTK that we just built, that we're about to build, then those would come up yellow, right? But they're coming out beige because they're not built against the new GTK. And the compose and deploy elements they actually take their dependencies and create something else with them. So they need a flag to say that even if you're building in not strict mode, which means don't rebuild reverse dependencies, well, rebuild me anyway because I'm actually consuming those dependencies and doing something with it, right? So here, we should have a rebuilding GTK. If not, you know, I retire. Okay. Okay, good, 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 good. Mm. So with the dual monitor here, we don't really see the status area very well, and there's not a lot of queues. Um, and we're not building anything in parallel, but BuildStream will build everything in parallel that it can according to some limits that you give it. So. When I build the whole GNOME like meta core thing with the GNOME shell and everything, it's about 170 or so modules, including WebKit, and I get the whole thing done in less than two hours on this laptop, which means I compile a lot of stuff while WebKit is compiling. Um, so I can come back to that after. Mm, how much time do we have? Already? Oh my, my. Okay, so what, so what is BuildStream is, so when you make a BuildStream project, you have to think about, you're thinking about making, designing a pipeline of elements that are going to create some output, right? So think, think GStreamer for the file system. Think uh, you can make all kinds of elements that you want. The input is file system data. It's the input is the artifact created by what it depends on, and some sources, or not, and produce some output. And that's basically the basic idea of the design. Um, so here we have some couple of examples. This is. Right, so in my converted module sets, I have been building on top of a Debian base because I find it's a lot easier than wrenching together a Yocto baseline to build on top of. So I just have to add some packages. And also, it's much more interesting, I think, for us if we want to test against like the latest Fedora and the latest Debian and like why don't we test our software against distros that we care about and more than one of them? So this one is basically what I've been testing with. We import a dbootstrap based system which we revision in OS tree so we know it's bit for bit identical every time. And then we have some different stacks and we build stuff. Then we compose it together, and then we create a bootable image running uh, syslinux and this kind of stuff. And presto, you get a big fat image, or you get a filtered down image, so you don't have to have 13 gigs of image. And this is another example of, these are the two examples of the 
the pipeline that I have here building. So it's the same project that creates different outputs and it depends on different inputs, right? So this one, we import a free desktop Flatpak SDK and we build only the parts of GNOME which go into a GNOME SDK plus a few things in the GNOME SDK that were not in the module set so that we have the basically everything that's going into the JSON right now. And we can have two different outputs. One is, uh, well we, we obviously didn't, you know, iron out all the kinks. We still have to think about the locale moving directories thing and the extension points, you know. Right now we're just removing all the debug system because symbols because there's nine gigabytes of them. And now it's in the middle of deploying that. So that, that's going to take a minute. I'm sorry, Dave. You should have told me earlier. <laughs> really, you know. <laughs> this is a. Uh, Uh, yeah, okay, okay. I wanted to leave more time for questions, and that's why I was asking him to give me more heads up than that. Mm. Okay, so I built the pipeline, and I'm checking it out, right? This is, a, I didn't write a script for this, but there's only a few, you know, bits to it. Uh, it takes time, sorry, who was that? Did somebody start asking a question? <laughs> um. So it's two gigs, which is still too much but not with nine gigs of debugging. So we're, d we're just doing this really hacky like, you know, we, we have what is looking like a runtime and we're, we're just pretending and we're, we're committing a new revision. Have to remember to update the summary file and then upgrade the flat pack. This is the longest part. Um, where can we go to learn more about Bitstream and how to start using it? We can go, oh, oh we go, I have a whole section I did not go through. Yeah, <laughs> this is what happens, you know? Yeah, so yeah, these places. One is the GNOME Wiki project page, which has links to anything you want to know. Um, before we get into questions, specifically I should say that we have a BOF on Wednesday and we're gonna try to put together a workshop if it's not too much trouble to download all the artifacts and stuff with, if network permits, but we're gonna show a bit more how it all works. And okay, now we're updating the, uh, I have a remote which is that local thing. Uh, yeah, okay. All right, yes. But I don't see any underlines, so. <laughs> see, I don't know if that's a problem, okay. Okay, so officially the talk's finished and it's lunchtime now. Um, I'm sure Tristan will be very happy if people want to stay for a little while and ask him some questions. Um, and I can pass the mic around a little bit for that. Thanks Tristan, so um, why is Billstream particularly relevant for GNOME then? That's, th that's exactly in the slides that I just missed out on, you know. 
So this was about what we're going to do for GNOME, right? So JH build, if it builds exactly like this for me, it builds exactly the same way for you, right? Mostly we have all the same development workflow stuff. We can boot VMs. Uh, we have artifact cache sharing, so if you built it, I can use it, and vice versa. Uh, consolidation of build metadata, so we can maintain all of the GNOME releases, we can re maintain the GNOME Flatpak SDK, and hopefully we can also have GNOME Continuous contributing to the artifact share all together with the same module sets. And the crowd goes wild! <laughs> any, any more? I mean, I'm not that hungry. <laughs> <laughs> So it's nice that you integrate with JH build, and maybe I missed it. But um, if it's better than JH build, and we do use it a bit for uh, the release team, but there's no reason why we need to use JH build. We could also just say like, screw JH build, remove that, switch over. That that that's the idea. Yeah. Th thank you for suggesting it. <laughs> What those, so y it kind of looks at the, the, the cached artifacts and pulls the builds back out if, if it looks like it's going to be the same source with the same dependencies. But when you're actually doing the build, do you do anything inside the build to uh, you know, get all the reproducible stuff so the same source, like file by file, gives you the same binary? Because I'm really thinking like if you end up changing one file, you rebuild the library, you know, how, how identical will it be? Will this help us reduce kind of bloating if you rebuild a flatback runtime with some changes? Will you get the same binaries for everything else? Um, I think that we don't want to contribute to the artifact cache share in non strict build modes. Ba we basically just want the different, well, but I it's okay, but it should, it should not go into production, you know? I mean, not strict build mode means that you haven't built the reverse dependencies. So, I mean, we do generate a unique cache key based on that source, and we detect which, which modules have been built against that workspace. So if something is built against a workspace, we don't up upload that to an artifact share already. And if you're just building, you don't want to rebuild everything, but you just have something new, and then you can build it and you can try it, but it's better in strict mode. In strict mode, you're going to rebuild everything. Yeah. And we also prioritize the ideal artifact cache key in non-strict build mode. So we're going to ask, We first we query the server for a summary file, and we look to see if, if a strong artifact key, like uh, which would be the one that would have been built with the reverse dependencies build is available on the server, we're gonna download it anyway, right? Kind of answers the question? Uh, kind of, yep. I, I don't know how it works, but I'm not good. I can think of it, so I, I can keep going. <laughs> okay, it'll probably be the last question. So, <coughs> in the strict build mode, do you build it linearly, or does each module have the minimal set of dependencies when it builds? Everything is built against only the dependencies that are build dependencies of it. So okay. we also have runtime dependencies, which don't have to be staged, and they can be parallelized further on, right? Anything that is required for the build is staged in a kind of deterministic dependency order and then we build directly on that. So every sandbox is dynamically generated. Okay, sounds good. I mean, that, that should, I think, go what your question was. It's that should give us a higher chance of a build being identical, even yeah. if something before it in the chain changed, yeah, yeah. if that didn't happen to have a direct dependency. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we're a few minutes over time. So thank you very much, Tristan, for your talk. And, uh, <laughs>
Thank you.